and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. And we now turn in your hymnals to page 630, 631 and following. We're going to be working with Richard Brodigan's uh, text, All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. We are now into the second poetry collection that will group uh, uh, several poems together. We'll be looking at this text. We'll be looking at a couple of poems by Emily Dickinson, um, Hope is the Thing with Feathers and Much Madness is Divine Sense. And we'll be looking at Stanley Kunitz's The War Against the Trees. Notice that we've got your big question, how does communication change us? And then the vocabulary on page 630. Let's turn now to 633 in this poem by Richard Brodigan. Um, and let's ask a couple of things about Brodigan before we begin. I'm with you on 631. Notice your dates, 1935 to uh, 1984. With his 1967 novel, Trout Fishing in America, Brodigan became a spokesperson for the hippie generation. Ironically, he was at least 15 years older than the hippies and a product of the beat generation that had preceded him. Nevertheless, his writing demonstrates his free spirit. His books present sketches of a counterculture that resists dependence on machines, industry, and business. Let's go ahead now and turn to the poem itself on 633, uh, um, and let's see what we can understand about the message of a poem like this. I like to think, I'm reading now on 633, all watched over by machines of loving grace. I like to think, and the sooner the better, of a cybernetic meadow where mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony like pure water touching clear sky. I like to think, right now please, of a cybernetic forest filled with pines and electronics where deer stroll peacefully past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. I like to think, it has to be, of a cybernetic ecology where we're free of our labors and joined back to nature, returned to our mammal brothers and sisters, and all watched over by machines of loving grace. I'm actually going to begin at 3A and text to text observations. What do you make of that picture on 632? Look at the picture on 632 and the little bit that you understand already about the poem that you just read. Do you see it, that picture on 632? What do you make of that with all of those zeros and ones in the picture and all of that? We're talking now about the picture right next to the poem itself. The poem is on 633. The picture is on 632. What do you make of that picture and why they would put that picture with this poem? Now, there are a couple of readings of this poem. Let's say it out loud. One is, of course, a literal reading of this poem. And a second is an ironic reading of this poem that speculates for Brodigan on a critique of society. Okay, So let's go ahead and begin to ask the question, what is it that he is saying when he says, I'd like to imagine a world that has, now you fill it in, level one. What is he saying? I'd like to imagine a world where what? You fill it in. Well, one argument could be, I like to imagine a world where we're not completely dominated by technology, right? By all of the forces of technology. I'd like to imagine a world where humans and technology can coexist instead of somehow being antagonistic to each other. Look at the way he says this in the three stanzas. By the way, notice the parenthetics, which will remind us in our junior year, we're going to study a, a poet named E.E. E. Cummings. We're going to see him a little bit later in our freshman year in this, in this poetry anthology of Unit 4. E.E. E. Cummings liked to play this game of parenthetics. Look at it. I'd like to think, and then the parenthetics, and the sooner the better, exclamation point, of a cybernetic meadow where mammals and computers live together in mutual programming harmony, like pure water, notice your simile here, like pure water touching clear sky. In other words, I'd like to imagine a world that I don't, I don't live in. This is that critique, right? This is that critique. Now, in your freshman year, we do a lot of this critique of what we sometimes will call dysutopian novels. The idea of the apocalyptic kinds of novels and the critique of those novels, Ayn Rand's Anthem, comes to mind, for example, of postulating a world where technology has so taken over that humans become less human. But notice here, he's going to personify technology with the word computers. And he's going to imagine that we all live together in harmony, like pure water touching clear sky. 
in the second stanza. I'd like to think right now, please, he says, a cybernetic forest filled with pines and electronics where deer stroll peacefully past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. The idea that computers would be understood by everything in the natural world as, compu as completely natural. And then finally, I'd like to think it has to be a cybernetic ecology where we're free of our labors and joined, and then there it is, the term, back to nature. It's a very popular phrase, back to nature, right? Returned to our mammal. Notice twice he uses this idea of the mammals, right? Mammal brothers and sisters, all watched over by machines of loving grace. Now, of course, this final line is the title of the poem, All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace, and this is deeply disturbing. We immediately think of George Orwell's 1984, Big Brother, The Eye in the Sky, and the degree to which technology has so far taken over the world of nature and our world, of course, that there doesn't seem to be so easily an understanding of how we can cohabitate. But notice the irony. Can you live without your cell phone? The 3B question. If we were to say all technologies for you go away, what would be the technology most would miss? Many of you will say it is that cell phone that you are somewhat attached to, and you would have to argue that it would fundamentally change you if you didn't have your cell phone, which does beg a really interesting question. Are you watching your cell phone, or is it watching you? Do you take care of your cell phone, or does it take care of you? And what is the relationship between you and technology, and humans and technology? Let's go ahead and work now level two and three quickly. At level 2A, well, what for you are the primary messages here? Well, many have said that one obvious message here is that there is a disconnect, it seems, in our world. Between the natural world, Ruthie's tree obviously serving as the symbol of all symbols in our room 303, Ruthie's tree, nature, and then the world of technology which becomes increasingly more and more pervasive. It's almost as if to be human, you have to have the technology now. And, of course, Richard Brodigan was deeply concerned about this idea. Back to nature is the way he talks about it right in his poem. There's a second message here that says that we always dream of a better world which is why we have technologies in the first place. The whole notion of the invention of the wheel, and by extension, the invention of the cell phone, the, the smartphone, was so life could be better, right? So we could be happier, which begs a question. Does technology make us happier? Does it make us able to coexist with each other better? Or rather, is this poem suggesting that these machines don't have any feelings? These machines don't have any loving grace. In other words, Rodigan is suggesting what is impossible, that somehow machines would become more humane. More humane meaning more loving, more kind, which is not the case at all. This degree to which algorithms dominate our life is, of course, the great question. It, some have called it the Google question, right? When you do search engines and the like and all of that, or your attachment to anything from face filth to anything else that you're involved with on the technology side. At 2B, notice you've got some very interesting things happening in this poem. For example, note the irony. I like to think. I like to think. I like to think which is, of course, the notion of I wish. In other words, I don't really believe that this is possible, but I wish that it was possible. Then the parenthetics, right? Um, for example, the sooner the better, right now please, it has to be. And notice there's exclamation points after each one of those three. Did you see that? In other words, it's as if he's stepping into his own poem and saying, no, no, I'm really serious about this, which begs the question at, at, uh, to be, though, is he ironic? Is he saying this in an ironic tone? He's aware we can no longer go back to nature because technologies have somehow made us increasingly less and less real. We're more and more artificial, if you will. At 3A, the text I'm going to set you up for when you're seniors is T.S. Eliot's classic poem, The Hollow Men. The idea that we continue to be increasingly more and more full and more and more empty all at the same time. The observation that if you were to hit the print key on every text that you sent and received in the last year, the paper would fill this room. 
And yet the question is, what do you say in all those texts? All those words that are exchanged, what actually is being said? What is actually of importance in all of those words? At 3b, of course, the question is simple. Do you believe in the idea that we can return back to nature? Or are we forever going forward with technology? Right? The questions, of course, of cyborgs and artificial intelligence, AI, creates all kinds of concerns about what it means to live in a world where the grandmaster in chess can be beaten by a computer. Whoa, what does it mean to suggest that machines have that level of power? Of course, at 3A, what is for you the text of all texts that seems to suggest we got to be careful about technologies? For many, many years, the film of all films that students would write about was the Terminator films, which of course is a premised on the idea, along with the Matrix films, that machines began to take over. Do you believe that humans can control their uses of technology? Or, rather, is it kind of pervasive? When I speak now with parents of young children, they will often report the, di the difficulty of how to relate with their child and technology use. Do you only give them X number of minutes, for example, looking at the iPad or the smartphone? Do you somehow limit their exposure? And in the process of making those decisions, are you fighting that uphill battle like Sisyphus and his rock? Sooner or later, all of us increasingly are more dominated by the phone. Watch a two-year-old playing on a smartphone, and it's natural to the kid to be able to navigate that kind of technology. What will it look like when that child is a grandpa or a grandmother? Right? The future. Let's, let's jump to 3B finally. What, what is your relationship to technology? Do you feel like technology controls you, or do you control it? If we were to say that we will go for an entire week without our phone turned on, what would that do to your life? And why would it do what it would do to your life? To what degree are you completely consumed with technology? What would you miss most if you didn't have the technology? Would it be the music? Would it be the social exchanges? What would it be for you? Well, there you go, Richard Brodigan's All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. I hope you enjoyed the ironic text.